brother and his sister in Christ. So we're pleased to present him this morning to preach on the all-sufficiency of the church. He's been preaching at the San Mateo congregation for 27 years. <clears throat> He's married to the former Pamela uh, Joan Hackworth. They have a daughter, Leslie, married to Jeremy Hicks. They have a two-year-old daughter, Tenny, Tenny short for Tennessee. I don't know why they couldn't name her Texas and call her Tex, but <clears throat> that, that's, a, that's their choice, you know. <laughs> Uh, Leslie works remotely in HR for a Silicon Valley company, and Jeremy works remotely for a tech firm that was uh, recently bought, bought by Salesforce, and I don't know who Salesforce is, but Johnny knows. And Johnny and Pam have a son, uh, Andrew, who is an analyst at Seas Candy. That, that's very sweet. Johnny's in his 13 year as director of the English Lectures, preaching the whole Council of God, and that's a good work there in uh, England. And uh, we pray that that may continue for many years to come. So, But Johnny's going to speak on the all sufficiency of the church. Come speak to us. I should have known some of the things I mentioned as Ken, he would get it wrong. And other things I've mentioned to Ken, he wouldn't understand. But I have to say, uh, especially during this visit, that Ken is the kind of man who will give you the shirt off his back. You'll know more about that later. I do want to thank the elders of the congregation, the congregation itself, for uh, having this event and inviting us. I look out and I see uh, so many familiar faces, uh, some who have grown up and some who have grown old. And I look over at David and I just wonder which one is going to be next. <laughs> but I, I remember David from Years ago when he came to San Mateo, he had just come from Singapore, I believe, and he had just gotten a new suit, and he preached a good uh, gospel meeting there in San Mateo, and I thought um, how fortunate uh, it was going to be for him to be uh, preaching in spring, and of course, he's been here for near 30 years or more, if not 30 years, so uh, very uh, blessed in that way. I also look out and I see Danny and Bruce, uh, who have been my co-workers at the, uh, in the UK work. And they have been a tremendous help to me and tremendous help to the brethren there. And I'm gonna tell you now that if you are a preacher, young or old, uh, in the two days that I'm here, I'm going to come for you because we need more preachers and teachers over there. Now, it has expanded tremendously. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but I do want to uh, say that the work that those two brothers have uh, provided, uh, along with some others, others <clears throat> has been uh, incredible and tremendous. I have a boot over there. You'll see me wearing it this afternoon. No thanks to my wife. Uh, if she wasn't here, I wouldn't have it. And you can take that as it may. <laughs> but I'm glad she's here with me. She's had an opportunity to see some of you, a number of you, uh, for the first time in years. And, of course, uh, she makes my travel much better. Uh, I don't have to fight Sue. So uh, today we are uh, talking about the all-sufficient church. I looked over the topics that uh, David selected, and I thought, what a wonderful selection of topics. Uh, one, it will help anyone who is in the church who needs to know more, and it will help anyone who does not know that much about the church uh, to certainly understand <clears throat> what they need to do to become a Christian 
and the importance of the church and just church life. My topic is the all-sufficient church. We start with the word sufficient, and we ask for the definition of that term. What does the all-sufficient church mean? It means the church that is using the word sufficient, adequate, capable, good enough, fully supplied. We think about that in contrast to insufficient. And with insufficient, we think of, sometimes people think of insufficient funds or something that is uh, insufficient evidence. Uh, I often think about it, and this is probably a particularly Mac point of view. When I'm sitting in Starbucks and I'm on my laptop and I see people with Windows laptops having to have these big bricks because they can't be there more than 20 minutes before the power goes out. That's insufficient. <clears throat> the question, though, is the Lord's church all sufficient? And what exactly is that question asking? That's not the question David asked. He said the all sufficient church. So what exactly does that mean? It's asking, in some instances, do we need more than the church? more than the church for salvation? Is there something that needs to go beyond the church? Is there something after the church? Is there something that the church lacks? Is there something that the church will need in addition for salvation? Well, the shorter answer to that, of course, is the church is all-sufficient. It's not lacking in any way. It provides us with all that we need here on earth. And then we ask, why? Why is it adequate? Why is it completely capable? Why is it good enough? What makes it so? What makes it wholly adequate? What makes it all that it needs to be? And then we, we could take that, and I looked at David's lesson, I thought this could be almost encyclopedic, the way that it's, it's presented, because you talk about a capable builder, you talk about is the blood of Christ sufficient, the sacrifice sufficient, is the word sufficient? That's a question that could be a part of this lesson. We will look at some of these. The all-sufficient church. And we will ask ourselves, do we have everything that we need? If we look at a couple of verses... The first of which in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. And such trust that we through Christ to God would not that we are sufficient ourselves to account anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Also in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, as his divine power have given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's a simple verse, seemingly, but it provides a lot of heft or depth. All things that pertain to life and godliness. This goes back to something Brother Danny was talking about. It. At least he int <clears throat> excuse me, intimated the idea that anything that you want to know, really, about being a Christian, you can find in the scriptures, as David said, you can know, you can know. And then we, we talk about, when we talk about sufficiency, we're talking about a level of supply. We're talking about supply. It suggests supply. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, all your need according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need. And the word supply there means, of course, to make full. God will provide everything that you need. So for the church to be all sufficient, these different components that make up the church are what we want to talk about today, the, the pattern or the design of the church, the, the builder, the architect of the church, the head and body of the church, the perfect law of the church. <clears throat> and believe me, these are only a few of the many things that you could look into that go into making all of the various components, 
that go into the church. We talk about the all-sufficient design or pattern. And of course, when we look at that, we understand from the very beginning that the church is not something that was haphazardly created or built by God. It wasn't on a whim. It wasn't something that was an afterthought. It was built according to the perfect pattern that God had in his mind before the foundation of the world. I think that's a very important part of understanding the sufficiency of the church is that before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, God had the church and the pattern of the church in his mind. He already knew before there was the garden, before there was Adam and Eve, before there were the various stories that we have from the Old Testament, God had already planned, God had already in his mind determined what the church would be. Prefigured, perhaps, we think about in the Old Testament by the, the tabernacle, maybe later the temple. But if we look over in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, <clears throat> Paul writes, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And of course the purpose of that preaching was that they would hear and obey the gospel and become members of the body of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now until the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In writing this, of course, Paul again intimates that this is not something that is carelessly created, something that is improvised, something that has not been well planned, well thought out. We go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 25 and verse 9, and we see that God told Moses, according to all that I show thee, the pattern of the tabernacle the pattern of all the furniture thereof, even so shall we make it. In that statement, we see the careful architecture, creation by God of something that he wants to put in place for man. Brother Danny said before, God is not going to give us or command us to do something that we cannot do. He is not going to give us something that is not perfectly designed and created. The Hebrew writer reminds us that Moses warned of God, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 15. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern that was showed thee in the mount. So again, the idea of a pattern. The idea of the church being in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. The idea that God was going to provide something for man. That would be the most amazing creation ever, if we think in terms of the church as a creation. Something that was holy of God with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. We think then of the sufficient builder, an all-sufficient builder. If you're going to have a pattern, if you're going to have a blueprint, you need to have a builder. And of course we know that verse in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. And when Jesus said that he would do that, it represented the fruition or the fulfillment of prophecy. But also we look at the word itself, ecclesia, which we all hear. I'm sure Brother David has used that word many times, Brother Ken and everyone else who's taught. Greek term for assembly. We think about how people in the world today understand the word church, use the word church, you think of a building. The word church 
has never had that, um, that the word assembly has never really had that idea behind it. The assembly of the people of God was what was in mind. And the coming of the Messiah, that caused the assembly to be reconstituted in ways that they certainly didn't imagine. Its identity will not be the nation of Israel, but rather it will be himself, his assembly. I will build my church. And we, we think about this from the standpoint of that term ecclesia, not a physical structure at all, but always a community of people. Uh, we were recently studying in the book of Revelation, and if there's anything that comes through glistening, shining, and, and beautifully portrayed, it's the church. It's what the church is in the mind of God, what he intended it to be. We know that uh, the new temple is not a building of, uh, of literal stones, but rather consists of living stones. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. As God is a perfect being, Psalms 18 and verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect, then Jesus, his son, partakes of his perfect nature. Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 3. God, who has sundry times in a diver's manner, spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. We'll let that lead us into some other verses in a moment. By whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So knowing that God is perfect, his Son, the builder of the church, is perfect then the church itself will be perfect and all sufficient. But we'll get more on that later. Upholding all things by the word of his power. We have by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 7. Again, pointing us toward Jesus Christ as the builder of the church and what makes him all sufficient. When it says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men. And then in John 1, verses 1 through 3. One which all the children learn and everyone else remembers as well. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. But this, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So again, as we see the perfection of the Father, the uh, Godhead, and certainly the Son, the Son also perfect, perfectly following the perfect pattern when he built his church. Having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, Ephesians 1 and verse 5. That then brings us being the perfect builder. He is also the perfect head or all-sufficient head to an all-sufficient body. We think about the establishment of the church, Jesus being the head, all of this, of course, coming down to being his church, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22, 23. Everyone knows this. It's very difficult when you're trying to explain it to people who are not members of the church because they don't understand the relationship between the words church and body. But he had put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, Jesus is over all things to the church and Jesus himself is perfect then his body is going to be perfect as well, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That along with a passage found in the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether by thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, 
all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church. So the head of the body, who is the Son of God, is the all-sufficient head to an all-sufficient body, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in that all things that he might have the preeminence, in whom we have redemption, and we'll get to this part in the next verse, the next, the next uh, segment, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now that could be a, a complete segment in itself, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, because that is one of the things that makes the body perfect, actually. Uh, but I'd like to look at another verse, another set of verses found in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, I'm sorry, beginning with verse 11. <laughs> And I think this verse covers so much with regard to the all-sufficient head and the all-sufficient body. It said, but Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now you can break that down and you have probably four or five sermons right there. And that's a deep study just in that first portion. It continues, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, making the comparison, of course, to the sacrifices that emanate out of the book of Leviticus, how much more the blood of Christ? So he makes the comparison and something that the people can relate to, something that they understand fairly clearly. Through the eternal spirit, often himself without spot, perfect to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Now that set of verses in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, tell us a lot about Jesus Christ and tells us a lot about the church tells us a lot about the sacrifice that was made and why that sacrifice that was made is a sufficient sacrifice. And we could go deeper down into that in particular. But it does give us, again, more information about that. And the result is that 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Let's look at that verse again with regard to sufficiency, all sufficient church. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency as a result of what? As a result of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as a result of his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. As a result of those things, you now have all sufficiency. As it says, all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now again, that word sufficiency means enough, enough of everything. All things pertaining to life and godliness, all things pertaining to life and godliness. Those little subtle verses tell us that God fully supplies us with all that we need. Some people ask and got a question not that long ago from someone who was questioning their faith and the scriptures, wanted to know why we don't know everything that went on between the events that we're told about in the Bible. What happened between some of the days, what happened between, and the simple explanation is, again, God gives us everything we need to know for salvation. This is not a history book that's going to tell us everything for every, who knows everything that happened 
even in our own lives between 915 and 916. And so <laughs> he has given us all that we need, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. That means that the Christian, the person going back to Brother Danny's lesson, that the Christian may be perfect, sufficient, thoroughly or uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3, 17. It's amazing what the Bible tells us about what God provides us that allows us to have everything we need, all that we need to know, all that we need to know for eternal salvation, all that we need to know to live right before him, all that we need to know to be pleasing in his sight. We are his workmanship, created in Christ, which means created in perfection, unto good works, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Perhaps we sell ourselves short, or perhaps people sell God short, in thinking that, as we see in much of the world today, the reason that so many things go the way they go is because we're born that way. We can't help it. Maybe the, maybe the devil made me do it. Not really sure, but it's as if when we look at verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God doesn't provide a way of escape. There's always the ability to say no. So we know really deep down and, and honestly and sincerely that God gives us all of the things that we need. Jesus is not only the head of a, the perfect body, but he is also the perfect Savior, Ephesians 5.23. And he gives us not just an all-sufficient law, but he gives us a perfect law. And I think that's one of the highlights and really important things about our thinking during this time period. It is the law of God, the law of the Lord, Psalms 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. So again, we think about the all-sufficient church. It has a not only all-sufficient law, it has a perfect law. The gospel is a law as coming with the full force of a divine command. It is perfect in every sense. And it perfectly provides us with the unsullied glory of all the attributes of God. All that we need to know about God can be found right here. All that we need to know in order to obtain eternal salvation can be found right here. We don't have to have uh, any additions to the, you know, like the Oxford English Dictionary. We don't have to have uh, a new edition. We don't have to have any of those things. We, we know from Jude 3 that he has provided us all that we need once for all time with regarding to salvation. So this perfect law of liberty, and we want to talk about that for just a few seconds and ask ourselves if we really appreciate it in that way, if we look at it that way. We think about how the Moses dispensation we think about the old testament termed a yoke of bondage and uh, as peter said it was neither we nor our fathers who were able to bear it the perfect law was given to guide the perfect body the church and understand this eliminates excuses we say eliminates excuses we're talking about ourselves we're talking about the people that we know Eliminate excuses in what way? People say, well, I can't make it to worship services because. And sometimes we have people who can't make it to worship services because they're ill or various reasons. But 
Many times people don't make it to worship services because they don't want to. Many times people don't read the Bible, going back to what Brother Danny was talking about earlier, and certainly uh, our Brother David as well. People don't do things because they don't want to do David can preach on a certain topic until he's blue in the face. And there will be someone who will do the opposite anyway. Why? Because we still find people who will be self-willed, who will depart from that perfect law of liberty. The elders will try to guide a congregation in a particular way, and people will become upset about it. Why is that? Because they depart from that perfect law of liberty. They, they reject the authority that the, the scriptures give the elders. The perfect law given to God, the perfect body, that law coming from the head of the body, James 1, 25 calls it, calls the word of God the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. And that word perfect, of course, means completed, brought to an end, finished. The word, that perfect law of God brings real liberty to freeing us from the curse of sin and from the power of sin. If Eve had only listened. If Samson had used more common sense. Many people in the scriptures we see it is a departure from God's perfect law that causes people to have sin in their life, stress sometimes in their life. And disaster sometimes in their life. In the verses prior to verse 25 in James chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, James talks about the word, the word of God, the scripture. He calls it a law because it is the authority, authoritative body of divine truth, which is the basis for the Christian faith. The perfect law of liberty. It is our rule of action. It is our standard of conduct. And a Christian's life is to be regulated by the gospel, by the New Testament. We understand in terms of our nation, we think about the Constitution. We talk about whether a particular action or event or something is constitutional. Well, in a much larger, much more important way, the perfect law of liberty, the law of God, the word of God, the scripture. That is our standard, our standard of conduct that God gave us in the old covenant and in the new. It is perfect because it originates from God. That perfect lawgiver cannot be bettered. People have tried over the years to come up with a better way to live than God gave us. You can go to the New York Times bestseller list. You can go to Dear Abby if she's still around. You can go to a number of people who will always give advice. But there's no advice better than the advice we get in the word of God. There's no advice better than that which we get from God through his holy and divine word. There is no better advice. It is without error and it is perfect for all situations, for all circumstances. Again, this is where people often doubt the power, the strength, the comprehensiveness of the Bible. They say, well, this book was written thousands of years ago. How can it help me today? But there's nothing that happens in our minds, hearts, soul. There's nothing that we can think of. There's nothing that we can imagine. There's nothing that we can consider that God has not already dealt with through the scriptures. That's why it is the perfect law of liberty. In the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ hath made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The law of Moses was incapable of providing the justification of sinners. Acts chapter 13 and verse 39. 
And this liberty that God gives us is not a license to sin. Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. However you find that there are often people who feel that way. If I just do the wrong thing, God will forgive me. If I keep doing the wrong thing, he'll forgive me again and again. And sometimes that can lead, that leads people on the wrong track. It's not a license to sin. It's not a way, it's not a license to live any way that one wants to live. As Frank Sinatra once sang, I, you know, do it my way. Or as the Isley brothers used to sing, it's my thing. I do what I want to do. Well, not according to God's word. In John 14 and verse 26, Jesus, in talking to the disciples, speaking about the Comforter, which he says is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Why? Because that was the standard by which they were to teach and we were to live. I don't know what that was, if that was a signal or not. In John thir- uh, 16 and verse 13, again, he talks about all truth. And that means all truth is necessary for salvation. There were no extraneous comments made in the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. Peter told those people exactly what they needed to do. What must we, the simple question Straight and direct. What must we do to be saved? And Peter gave them a direct answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. What is the most important question? Salvation. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, asked that question. What must I do for salvation? In 2 and, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture given by inspiration of God. That's the first thing to remember. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that scripture that's given by inspiration of God is perfect. Why is it given? It, so that it can be profitable. It's profitable for what? For doctrine. A lot of people would probably like to take that out. Let's take doctrine out. Let's keep love and other these. But it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, the Christian, who has heard that word and obeyed that form of doctrine, might be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished to all good works. Today we talked a little bit about the sufficient pattern, the sufficient builder, the sufficient head, the sufficient body, the sufficient, more than sufficient, the perfect law of liberty. There are other areas that are a part of that question, the all-sufficient church, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Savior could go more into Jesus Christ himself. But we hope that we have at least given you something that you can take, that you can look into, that you can enlarge a study on for yourselves. To appreciate the beauty of the scriptures. To appreciate the complete and comprehensiveness of what God has given us as New Testament Christians. And to understand that it is in the church that all these things in the mind of God before the foundation of the world are to be found.